evening in Matthew chapter number 28. Uh, we're going to look on a very familiar passage of Scripture here uh, this evening, and I know that this is not a foreign uh, Scripture to you by no uh, stretch of imagination. Amen. I, I, I do believe that y'all are a mission-minded church. Your pastor was telling me earlier about uh, the harvest, I believe you called it the harvest offering, is that what you call it, which is an excellent idea that y'all take up and how y'all distribute, distribute that and how y'all uh, give to missions and different things. And I, I see your missionary board on the back, and I love the, the, the map there that points out where you have uh, missionaries at, amen. And so there's no doubt that I believe y'all are a mission-minded church this evening, and I, I'm thankful for that. It, it's good to know. When, when I was at my home church there before I ever was sent out, before I ever started deputation, I had this thought in my mind. And if we, and a lot of times we do, I had this thought in my mind, there's no other churches like our church. There's nobody else that believes what we believe. There's nobody else that lines up doctrinally the way we line up. But can I tell you, there's good churches all over. Amen. There's good churches all over the United States and all over the world. There's other friends that you have in Christ uh, that believe what you believe and that line up the way you line up. Amen. And But we're going to be looking on this passage of Scripture and I pray that you would not tone this out because it is familiar, but I pray that you would have the ears to hear uh, what the Lord would have for you this evening and open up your hearts and just see what the Lord would have for you. Amen. Matthew chapter number 28, verses number 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's pray this evening. Lord, I come to you again tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, and God, I am so grateful, Lord, for the day you've given us, Lord. Lord, I'm grateful, Lord, for uh, standing behind a sacred desk this evening. God, I don't, do not take it for granted. I pray that you would help us. Forgive me, Lord, for my I've failed you, Father. Fill me with your righteousness. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts. Examine us, Lord. See if there be any wicked way in us. God, if there is, Lord, I pray that we'd get that right this evening. But God, I pray that you would stir our hearts a little bit more this evening. Lord, for world evangelism, Lord, and getting the gospel out. Lord, I do love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to be looking on this passage of Scripture here this evening. And I'm going to have you turn to several other passages of Scripture and it may be kind of a popcorn drill or a Bible drills. I'm not giving out candy this evening. Your pastor will do that for you uh, if you turn there the fastest. Amen. Uh, but here we're going to be looking on this first passage of Scripture here. And we consider this passage of Scripture what we know as the Great Commission. The Great Commission, you probably, I'm sure you've heard that before. And uh, we've also heard it called the Great Mandate. And also the Great Orders given from the Lord. The Great Orders. Uh, that's what I like to call it there. Uh, do we have anybody in here this evening that's ever been in the military? couple. What branch were y'all in? Army? Army. All right. Perfect. I was in the army as well. What was the first general order? Get up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So what we, you, you remember it? It's been a while. So in the, in the military, uh, we were given things called orders. And what civilians know as orders is usually a piece of paper saying, go here, or go to training here, or be deployed here, or this, that, and the other. But while we were in our initial training, and our basic training, we were given things called general orders. And it was general rules that we had to memorize, if you would, and, and uh, operation, uh, operational things. Well, the first general order said, I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. Maybe bringing back a little bit of memory there. Let me, let, me ref let me say that again. It says, I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. Now, what that meant was is if, uh, if your commanding officer came and gave you a duty, whatever it was, whether it was to guard this certain area, whether it was to sweep the floor, or whether it was to sit in a guard tower, or whatever, whatever it was, it could have been out in the front yard cutting grass with a pair of scissors, and I have been there when I was in the Army. Amen. And uh, whatever that was, you were to do that duty and do whatever it is that they had given you to do until you were properly relieved. Until they said, okay, you can go home or you can, you can stand up or you can be finished with whatever you're doing. Well, can I tell you right here in this passage of Scripture, 
were given the orders from the Lord. The orders from the Lord. And can I tell you, we are only supposed to quit these orders when we are properly relieved. When the Lord has either called you home personally, or he has came back and got his church. Gotten his church there. And uh, so I, I know we go through times and we go through different seasons in our life and we go through sicknesses and we go through trials. But can I tell you, we should try to be persistent at what the Lord has given us to do. Amen. He doesn't give us the Great Commission and put an emphasis on, uh, but not in the time of coronavirus. Amen. He doesn't give us duties and things to do, but uh, not only not when you're, you're sick or not when you're having a rough time. But he gives us things, and we ought to be persistent in doing what the Lord has given us to do. In this passage of Scripture here, the first thing that I want to look at is the who in carrying out the Great Commission. Who is the Lord speaking to in this passage of Scripture? Now, oftentimes what we do is we put this passage of Scripture, and we'll put uh, uh, verses like Acts 1-8 uh, on missionaries, just on missionaries. But can I tell you right here, it says, in verses number 19, if you're reading your Bible there with me, it says, go your pastor. Is that what that says? Go your missionary. No, the Bible doesn't say that. It says, go ye therefore. Can I tell you what that word ye means? It means if you've been born again, if you've been washed in that blood, if the Lord has saved you, then this passage of Scripture is given for me and for you. Amen. It's not just given for the Sunday school teacher or for the outreach director or coordinator, or for your pastor, it's given for every single one of us that have been born again. Amen. The ye, ye, ye. Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We see that the Word of God is talking to every single one of us. He was speaking to the disciples, the one that uh, followed him and the ones that believed in him here. But the next I want to look at is the what. What is the Great Commission? What do we see here that this passage of Scripture is speaking on? And we're going to kind of look in a backwards order here. But first we see that it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The Great Commission is teaching the Word of God. And I want, I want to make an emphasis here uh, this morning of how important it is for us to teach the Word of God. How important discipleship is. We're going to look on a verse here, or a passage of Scripture here in Matthew chapter number 13 here in just a couple minutes of the parable of the sower and the seed. The sower and the seed here. And it says that some seed uh, was planted among the thorns, and it says, and they grew up and became unfruitful. Uh, you, 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 have you ever wondered what happened to so-and-so that came in the church, and they said they got saved, uh, we led them to the Lord there, they said they were got saved, or maybe you knocked on the door and they said they got saved, or maybe you had a, a missions conference or a revival or something like that. Then it, maybe they were coming for a little bit to church here, and it seems as, as soon as they, that happened, uh, they were out in the world and they just vanished and, and you've never seen them again. What well, can I tell you oftentimes? I believe where we lose a lot of Christians, lose a lot of people that did get saved, is we fail to disciple them. I don't mean, mean they lost their salvation. But what I mean is, uh, they got saved, but we failed to grab them by the hand. We failed to teach them that it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle against. We failed to teach them what sin is. We failed to teach them what right and wrong is uh, throughout the Scripture, and they just kind of grow up in the world. And the Bible says there that they became unfruitful, hinting that maybe once that they were fruitful. So it is very important that we not only teach new converts, but we teach our children what the Bible says. Amen. Can I tell you, if you're not teaching your children or your grandchildren what that word says, the world is teaching them otherwise. The world is teaching them something else. You want to know why that we have uh, the divorce rate that we have here in America, which is, I believe it's over 50% chance that you're going to get divorced. You want to know why, uh, like down in Sioux Falls, there's this church called the First Congregational Church of Sioux Falls. And you drive by there, if you've ever been downtown there, it looks like an old Catholic church or maybe an old Lutheran church. And on the side of the building, they have a sodomite flag hanging from the side of the building there. And if you do research and you go look up their doctrine there, you go look them up on the, their website, they are a sodomite church. And this is what they teach. You want to know why we have churches 
that are like that here in the country and around the world is because we failed to pass this Bible down from generation to generation. We failed to teach our children uh, to have that reverence toward authority. Uh, you want to know why? You've seen the video there of the uh, defund police sign that was there. I'm pretty sure, if I remember right, that video was taken in Minneapolis a few years ago. You want to know why we have things like that? It's because we failed to pass down this Word of God. Amen. It is the teaching. The Great Commission is the teaching of the Word of God. We also see that it is the baptizing. Once you see somebody get saved, like I said, we're kind of going backwards here, but I want to make an emphasis on one thing. Uh, we see that it's baptizing. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now we see when somebody gets saved, they are baptized. I don't believe in a baptism regeneration this evening. I don't believe that that baptism saves you, uh, does anything for your salvation. It is merely uh, what the Lord, a representation of what the Lord done for us. As he was uh, buried in the heart, as he died and he was buried in the heart of that earth, and as you are fully submerged in that water, that word baptism means immersion. That means you go all the way underneath that water, amen. And as you are brought back up to walk in that newness of life, uh, that is what that baptism is. And can I tell you here this evening, it, it should throw a, maybe a red flag up if someone, especially in our country, where we have the freedom to worship the Lord, it should throw a red flag up to us if somebody refuses to get baptized after they have uh, salvation or maybe they, they said they got saved. It should be a red flag there. If they refuse to identify what, they, what the Lord or refuse to identify themselves with the Lord. Can I tell you what that is? That's like me walking in a restaurant, me sitting down at a table with me and my, me and my wife, and right before the waitress, I see the waitress coming over, and right before I do, I take my wedding band off, and I put it in my pocket. Now, my wife would look at me and be like, what in the world are you doing? Right? Right? That wedding band represents a marriage that took place. Amen? That baptism represents a marriage that took place. Amen? And you being the bride of, of the Lord there. Amen? And so we see it is the teaching of the Word of God. We see it's baptizing but more, uh, right before all that, we see it is the preaching of the Word of God. The preaching of the Word of God. We see at the end of uh, Mark here, in Mark chapter uh, number 16 and verses number 15, it said, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And preach the gospel to every creature. Now I know what you're saying here, you're thinking here this evening, uh, Brother Scott, I see, you see right there, uh, that's where I got you at, because it's just for preachers. Well, can I tell you, be a reminder to you here this evening, that word preach doesn't mean a bishop standing behind a pulpit, but that word preach means to proclaim the gospel. That word preach means to proclaim, amen. So we see that we are supposed to be preaching or uh, telling other people about the Lord. Now hold your place there in Matthew chapter number 28, and go and mean your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number 13. We're going to look at on a passage of Scripture here. And I want, to, I want to make an emphasis on this one thing here. And if there's uh, anything that I've tried to do since I've been on deputation, is try to make an emphasis on doing this one thing. And that is uh, preaching the Word of God or proclaiming the Word of God. In Matthew, cha I'm on Matthew chapter number 13, I'm going to read two verses out of Matthew chapter number 6. And verses number 5, it's the Lord is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, and when thou prayest. And when thou prayest. The Lord doesn't say that you might pray. The Lord doesn't say that it's an option. But he says, and when thou prayest. I, asked, I told you earlier I was going to ask you a couple of personal questions. This next personal question here is, is, how consistent are you, don't answer this out loud, how consistent are you in your prayer life? I believe if we want to be right with the Lord, we will have that consistency in our prayer life. And what I mean, I'm not talking about a one, two, three, repeat after me. I'm not talking about when we just sit down for dinner or we sit down for breakfast or when we see a police officer passing by. But I want to, how often, how often, or how consistent is your personal prayer life with the Lord? Can I tell you, there's something you get in your prayer closet that you cannot get from anywhere else. There's a relationship that you tap in with the Lord that you can't get from just hearing your pastor preach. You can't get from just reading your Bible or listening to gospel music. 
There's something you get from that fervent prayer life with the Lord and a relationship that you tap in that is like no other. And can I tell you here, it doesn't matter how young you are, how middle-aged, how old you are, if you're missing that, you're missing something special. Amen. I urge you this evening, I urge you to be consistent, but to get up and to make an effort, to set aside time with the Lord. Now, I struggle in this often, but the Bible says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. You know what happens oftentimes is we have too much, too many things going on first thing in the morning, and we fail to seek the Lord. But what happens is, is we get up, we get ready for work, we hit the road, and we go to work, and we do whatever it is, and we'll say, Lord, I'll get to you later. Lord, I'll have my prayer time later. Lord, I'll have my Bible time later. But what we do is we let Satan and we let the world in and we let our flesh in far before we let the Lord in. It'd be good. I know how hard it is getting up at 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning, trying to make that time for the Lord, set aside time and having to leave to go at work and this, that, and the other. Uh, amen. I've, I've done that. I've, I've been there. I'm there now. It, it, it's still a struggle for me to have to get up, amen, in the mornings and uh, get down on my knees because this flesh does not want to, amen? But can I tell you, it is vitally important for each and every single one of us as a child of the Lord to seek Him, amen? We see it says, and when thou prayest, it also says, moreover, when ye fast. That's a word us Baptists don't like to hear. It's fasting. I believe if you want to be right with the Lord, you'll make an effort to having that prayer life with the Lord. I believe also there'll be times that you fast, that you would stain from food, that you go without in order to get answers from the Lord, in order to get closer to the Lord. You want to see somebody get saved? Fast. You want to see a building project come along? Fast. You want to see the, uh, you're praying about a new promotion at work, or a new job, or whatever it is. You want to know what the Lord's doing with you specifically and your family? Fast. But also we see here in Matthew chapter number 13, speaking on this thing of preaching the Word of God and proclaiming, we see, and I, I know we're, we're in a uh, an area where farming is everywhere. It's a farming community. It's a farming state here. It's uh, more presidents here than it is in down south in parts of the south there. But we see in Matthew chapter number 13 and verses number 3, and he said, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And catch this now, the sower is the one that is doing the Lord's work, the disciple, the one that is saved. The seed that he is sowing it, sowing is the word of God, and the ground that he is sowing it onto is the hearts of the individuals that he is sowing it to. It says, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and catch this now, and when he sowed. Not if he sowed, not that he might sow, but the Bible says, and when he sowed. I believe if you want to be right with the Lord this evening, being good stand, standing, so to speak, with the Lord, we, individually, we will make an effort into sowing this Word of God. We will make an effort into going up to somebody and placing a gospel track in their hands. We will make an effort to give our testimony out to people and, and talk to people about their salvation. Man, I, I just wonder here this evening, don't answer this out loud, don't raise your hand, but when was the last time when was the last time that you personally sowed the Word of God? When was the last time that you walked up to an individual out in public, at your work, at the grocery store, at the gas station, and said, hey, I, I want to tell you about a man named Jesus. I want to tell you how, how he died for you. I want to tell you about the love of Christ. Hey, I want to, I want to give you this gospel tracking encourage you along, along your way and give you something to read. I wonder when the last time that you personally done that. We had a gentleman at our, our home church there. We had formal discipleship classes in our church for a uh, new convert, for people joining the church, uh, what have you there. And in this setting, uh, we had this particular group that we had here. Uh, it was a husband and wife type setting in a classroom. And we had several couples in the, in the classroom there. And I remember the first uh, session for this particular group, we'd have, we'd go around the room and we'd have everybody give their testimony of how they had been saved. 
and it came to this one gentleman, and uh, you can tell he was kind of bothered, not in a sense of joyful because the Lord saved him, which he was, uh, but he was bothered, and uh, after the class, uh, he came up to me and the, my, my pastor, and he said, I want to let y'all know that is the first time, and he said he had been saved about 25 years or so, he said, I want to let you know that is the first time that I had ever told someone how I've been saved. Been saved 25 years. Can I tell you here this evening, that must not be us. That must not be me and you. Amen. You want to know why the Lord is still sending missionaries to America? It's because Christians down through the ages have failed to pass that gospel out. We have failed to pass it down to our children and we have failed to get it out uh, to one, to first our community, but we have failed to give it out across our states here. Amen. Can I tell you, we have had the greatest opportunity here in America, the way our country was founded. If I had to be real, we shouldn't need missionaries in America, anywhere. If Christians along the way have been doing what the Lord has given us to do. Amen. That doesn't have to be our future, though. Amen. That doesn't have to be uh, what we do from here on out. But I would encourage you. I want to encourage you. If I can do anything to encourage you personally, you, uh, whether it's you and your wife or you and your spouse there, you and your husband, but you personally, to give out the Word of God. Go up to somebody. I encourage you this week to at least give the Gospel out at least one time to an individual. Can I tell you, there's no telling. There is no telling what the Lord might do. There's no telling how the Lord will work in you and your family or you and your church. I can also tell you, I have given every excuse known to man not to do this specific thing. Me personally. Lord, I don't have enough time today. Right? Lord, you know I, I've, I'm at the gas station, but I have to go to work. Lord, you know I don't have time to stand here and give this, this individual the gospel. Lord, they look a little different than me, right? How many times have we done that one? How many, when, when was the last time uh, that the Lord put a, put a Hispanic person in front of you? Or put, I know in, South, in Sioux Falls there's a great African population. Put an African person in, in front of you and nudge your heart saying maybe they need the gospel. And Lord, you know I don't know Spanish. You don't think the Lord knows that? They probably know English better than you do. Amen. Right? But when was the last time that we said, uh, they, they look a little different to me. And what, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll put it off on the missionaries going to Africa to reach the Africans. We'll put it off on the missionaries going to Central America or going to Spain to reach the, the Spanish-speaking community. We'll put it off on the ones going to, to India to reach the, the Indians. Right? We'll put it off on the ones uh, going to the, the reservations to reach the uh, Native Americans here. Right? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter, which it does matter, but it doesn't matter how much money you give to the offering in, in your missions. That does not, that does not uh, give you the opportunity or the right, so to speak, for you personally not to give the gospel out. It is the duty for us to do both. Amen. That doesn't substitute one or the other. Hey, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit more to the missions offering today, so I don't, maybe that'll, you know, that'll win me a little bit with the Lord, so I don't have to give the gospel out personally. But the Bible says, uh, the Bible says uh, we're going to be looking at next the where to carry out the Great Commission. The who, the what, now we're looking at the where. Go flip in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1. Y'all still with me this evening? Amen. If I can find Acts here. Acts chapter number 1 and verses number 8. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. But we see here, I want to look at one word that is in two verses here. And this word, in verses number 8, this word is both. But it says, And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both. Now usually in our, in our society and today when we hear the word both or we say the word both or we think about that, we think of the number 2. That's what I do anyways. Hey, get me both of those things. Both of you, in my case, it's usually both of you kids be quiet. Right? We think of the number two. 
But right here in verses number 8, the word both means more than two. It says, and you shall uh, be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. Now that Jerusalem is right where you're at. That Jerusalem is where you work at, where you go to school at, uh, where you go to the grocery store at, where you go to uh, the store at, or whatever have you. That Jerusalem is the town that you live in. That's your neighborhood. That is where the Lord has placed you on a daily basis. And your Jerusalem, and everything else that I have said up to this point, is your obligation. Your obligation. Brooking, South Dakota, is your obligation. The place where you live at, whether you live in this community, or whether you live in the one next door, I'm not sure, but the place where you live at, the place where you go to the grocery store at, the place where you dine at on a regular basis, that is your obligation to reach those people. Not your pastors, not, not only your pastors, not only the Sunday school teachers, but for every single person that has been born again, that is your obligation. But all these other places that we're about to see and we're about to look at, we see your obligation before this. Next, we see your opportunity. The opportunity. It says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea. Judea, Jerusalem is right where you're at right now. Judea might be the rest of South Dakota. And in Samaria, that might be the rest of the United States. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's everywhere else in the world. But we are supposed to be witnesses, not in just our Jerusalem, but in all of these different places. Now, you may be thinking, and you're right if you think, well, it's physically impossible for me to be in all these different places. That is. I'm glad that you said that. But I want you to take notice, not only are we supposed to be giving the gospel out all these different places, we're supposed to be doing it all at the same time. Verses number 13 of uh, Acts chapter number 1. We're going to be looking on this word both again. In verses number 8, this word both means one, more than one place. But in verses number 13, it means at the same time. And when they were coming to the upper room, uh, they went up into the upper room. When they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode both. Peter, and James, and John, and Philip, and the rest of the disciples there. So all at the same time, that word both means they were all together there at the same time in the upper room. Can I tell you here what we're supposed to be doing this evening? We're supposed to be giving the gospel out right here in Brookings, South Dakota, as we are in Sioux Falls, as we are in Nebraska, and Georgia, and California, as we are in Canada, and India, and South America, and all these different places. We're supposed to be getting the gospel out there, but all at the same time time. And can I tell you, your Jerusalem is your uh, obligation, but everywhere else is your opportunity. And what I mean by that is it's our duty to reach there as well, but our opportunity to reach there. It says in Philippians, and I'll kind of cut this short a little bit, but it says in Philippians uh, chapter number 4, I believe it's verse number 17, Paul is speaking on the uh, topic of giving and receiving of uh, finances from other churches. Now, I know what a lot of people think when a missionary comes in. They're like, oh, they're just looking for some more money. They're just begging for money. But can I tell you here, that's not it at all this evening. You may be thinking that when I came in. Uh, that may be why some people didn't come back tonight, because they were just thinking that, amen. They knew that I was going to be back this evening. I'm kidding, brother. I don't, I don't want, want, want think that. But uh, what we have here is the Paul says, uh, not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You know what that tells me this evening? That tells me that we're supposed to be reaching all around the world, and we do that by sending missionaries out across the world. And you go back there, and you read your missionary letters of the ones that you support. And if you support, if you support your missions fund here at your home church, and you go back there like I was reading uh, that, that, I'm not going to name it, but I don't think it's his right name anyways, uh, that one in North Korea back there about how they're smuggling gospel tracts and how uh, they're discipling, and this, that, and the other. You go back there and you, you read that. And when they see a soul saved, can I tell you what that should do for you? You should be jumping with joy, knowing if you support your local mission fund, that's a little bit more added to your account, not here on earth, but in heaven. We are taught in our society to lay up treasures for ourselves right here on earth. But can I tell you, when you support missions, you're laying up treasures in heaven. You go read another missionary letter 
I believe you had one back there from India, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe somewhere in the Middle East there. But you go read that prayer letter, and when they say, look, we've seen another family discipled. We've seen another church plant turned over to a local pastor. You should be jumping with joy, knowing that's a little bit more added to your account. Added to your treasures that you're being laid up for in heaven. Can I tell you, the Lord can supply all the needs for all these missionaries if if y'all's church never uh, financially supported them. But can I tell you what it does when you do and when you pray for them on a regular basis, a little bit more added to your account. A little bit more added to your account. Now, I am no prosperity preacher by any stretch of imagination. I don't believe if you were to come in this evening and give a million dollars to the church that the Lord would forgive you from your sins and uh, everything would be just hunky-dory and you would never have any other problems. But I do believe in the promises that are given out in the Word of God. God gives us promises. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. Amen. Right here in Luke chapter number 6 and verses number 38, the Bible says, Give. The Lord says, Give. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, by good quality, that is, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure you make, uh, with all it shall be measured to you again. The Lord's saying, with how much sacrifice you give, He'll give back to us. I can't tell you if you give a thousand dollars to missions this month that the Lord's going to give you a hundred. I don't know the Lord's calculations. You may not ever see those rewards, some of those rewards, until you get to heaven. But can I tell you, the Lord gives us promises in this Word of God that we should, if you're not taking Him up on, Amen, you should. Amen. But can I tell you this here this evening? I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. I know y'all support missionaries around the world. I know y'all support church planting uh, movements here in, in the United States or church planters here in the United States. But I want to encourage you personally. This week, start this week. From now until next Sunday, at least give the gospel out to at least one person. I don't know how. I don't know what to say. Tell somebody how you got saved. You know how I got saved? My sister gave me her testimony while we were on the way back from a Bible camp when I was nine years old. She had told me how the Lord had saved her at that Bible camp. She didn't know John 3.16. She didn't know where Genesis or Revelations was, but she knew she was lost. She was in need of a Savior, and then she called upon the name of the Lord, and He saved her. And she began to tell me her testimony on the way back, and my mom turned around and looked at me as I was crying and squalling. She said, Son, what in the world is wrong with you? I said, Mom, I don't want to die and go to hell. And the Lord pricked my heart and said, Son, you, you'd lost. you in need of a Savior. Just because someone shared with me what the Lord had done for them. Amen. I went home. I bowed on my knees. I repented for my sins and called upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Lord, I come to you this evening in the name of Jesus. God, I'm thankful for the day you've given us, Lord. God, I'm thankful uh, that you...